I want to welcome you here to the desert of Palestine. We are in the West Bank right now and I've sat down here in the desert so you can get a view of a lot of um, date palm trees behind me and hopefully you can make out the glint of some golden domes. And those domes mark the spot of an ancient monastery, one of the most ancient in the world, if not the most ancient, and it is called St. Gerasimus. Anyone who has gone from Jerusalem, which is right um, in front of me, to Jericho, which is here behind me to my right, they will see this glint in the sunshine every time they come through this desert, and it sparks curiosity. But 2,000 years ago, this place was very, very uh, remote. Very few people came through here. And the communication between this monastery, St. Gerasimus, was across the Jordan here on the east to my left. And though it would be with um, uh, some monks, some hermits that lived in caves across the Jordan River. And so let's talk a little bit today about these desert fathers, this monastery, and particularly today focusing on a desert mother as we go into Holy Week. So today's monastery was actually built around the ruins of an ancient lavra. Remember we talked about that, it means like a hallway, it means a, a group, a cluster of cells of hermits or monks coming together in the desert. And it was called the lavra of Kalamonos. And this was founded by the desert anchorites in the time of the Empress Helen. And so they came out here in what used to be the middle of nowhere to pray and to live an ascetic life. And so this was eventually abandoned, particularly when the Persians came through in the 7th century and they destroyed a lot of different things. And then it was rebuilt again in the 13th century in the 1200s, and that's what we see today. In fact, if you go into the church, which is under those golden domes, you'll see a three-aisled church. And those are dedicated to some of the most important saints. First, of course, St. Gerasimus, for which the monastery has its name, St. Euthemios, who was here as well. And then the saints we're going to talk about today most particularly, which is Saint Zosimus and Saint Mary of Egypt. Now, <clears throat> Saint Mary of Egypt is the one who lived across the Jordan in this direction. And so she is what they call an Amma. We've spoken in these past Sundays about the Desert Fathers, the Abba. Now, there were also women desert mothers, and there were several of them who were important and very well known. But one of the most um, admired by the desert fathers is actually Mary of Egypt, and she has quite a story. So before we talk about the life of Amma, Mary of Egypt, let's remember some of the most important people that came through here and one of them we know well because we went to see his lavra over near bethlehem in the kidron over the kidron brook in that beautiful wadi and that is a saint saba remember we said that he came through this monastery and he stayed here for a while um, he was edified by the sanctity of the monks and then he went further south to found his own lavra that monastery which has been uh, inhabited for almost 2000 years or 1600 years well, this monastery is a place where also St. Gerasimus, which, you know, bears its name, his name. Um, and he came here in the fifth century with 70 monks and they lived in the desert uh, just east of Jericho and also very near the Jordan River. Of course, they wanted to be near the Jordan for a number of reasons, not only because Jesus was baptized in the river, which is the main reason, but also because, of course, John the Baptist was here um, as we spoke about, he was actually beheaded very close to this place across the Jordan River over in Macaris, but also because Elijah, one of the great Old Testament, we could call him monks, was taken up into heaven in the same place. And so they wanted to be close to all of these very spiritual events and bring them into their hearts and talk about them with the Lord. And then in that way to um, live a very a holy life. And so the life here in this laver was very strict. They slept on reed mats. They had cells without doors and they observed silence. Their diet, of course, if you look at you know, Jericho today, it's just packed with uh, date palms more than even in ancient times. And so that was one of their main um, foodstuffs. So they also ate uh, bread 
and water. So it was a very, very austere life. I also want to mention another saint that we've talked about, and that's Abba Pacomius. Remember, we said that he helped to put structure and order in some of the lavra of the monks that would come together and live in the desert. Well, this was no exception. In fact, this monastery was very well known for its discipline. So what does that mean? It was an organized lifestyle that men and women were living in separate places, um, up to three in a room in this monastery. They supported themselves by weaving cloth and baskets and other tasks. And so um, they were able to support uh, one another. Each new monk or nun had a three year probationary period. And that would be important before they were fully admitted into the monastery. All property was held in common and meals were eaten together in silence. Twice a week they fasted like they still do on Wednesdays and Saturdays. And they wore simple peasants clothing. They came together for prayer and readings. And then they also had programs that were created to educate the new ones who came to live this lifestyle. And so that's when they were formalized around an Abba, which would became, you know, the word abbot, or the Ama, which is the desert mother. And so they had the responsibility um, to look after one another because they became a new family here in the desert. And so they were organized into these communities and uh, really in this area, they became extremely popular. There were thousands of desert mothers and fathers, including in this monastery. So St. Gerasimus, who was he? Well, he was born in Asia Minor and as many um, desert fathers, he was born to a wealthy family, but there was something that he just didn't identify with uh, regarding you know, his other friends. And so he wanted to become a monk and he departed to the Egyptian desert as many of them did. And then he returned later to Asia Minor. But about the middle of the fifth century, he came here to Palestine and settled in this wilderness right here near the Jordan. And this is when he helped to establish this monastery and was known for um, being very righteous and lived a rigorous life of asceticism and prayer. Now, it's interesting if you go into the church um, and we'll take you there, you'll see on the floor mosaics of a lion. You'll see golden lions on the outside. There's lions decorated everywhere because that's who St. Gerasimus is always pictured with. And that's because there's a story of him um, one day out here in the wilderness. Actually, he found a lion that was um, injured. And so he actually uh, helped cure its paw, took out a thorn. <laughs> and um, then the lion almost became a, a part of the monastery. As we know from the Psalms in the Old Testament, uh, we even say, Hail, lion of, lion of Judah. You know, this place, these hills, both here and further north, they did have uh, mountain lions. And so this wasn't something that was unusual. And there's a lot of other, um, you know, stories that go along with the lion of St. Gerasimus, including that he would help draw water from the monks all the way over in the Jordan River, which would be their main water source here. So, I mean, that's why you can always see him um, with a lion, you know. So I want to talk to you also about another saint that's very related to Mary of Egypt. In fact, it's thanks to him that we know her story. And that is Abba Zosimus of Palestine. So he was um, also born in the fifth century. He was much younger than both Gerasimus and much, much younger than um, Amma Mary of Egypt. But he had a very interesting story, which brought him here to this place. So Abba Zosimus actually came here, we'll talk about that in just a second, uh, in a time where he was also in contact with the Patriarch of Jerusalem at that time. And his name was Saint Sos Sophronios, okay? He was a great father of the sixth and seventh century. And he wrote a great deal about the Desert Fathers, about the faith, and he wrote about Mary of Egypt. But he based his account on what uh, Abba Zosimus uh, told him when he encountered Ama Mary in this desert. So how did Abba Zosimus actually meet Mary of Egypt? Well, he was um, put into a monastery when he was quite young and he grew up there and he actually, they say, was very holy in his life. He saw visions, um, he was given the gift of many different things. And so he actually came to a time in his life when he entered into temptation and he thought of some sort of he thought himself as being sort of spiritually superior to, to the other people around him to the other monks and this is what it says in the story that the patriarch of jerusalem wrote he said that saint uh, zosimus when he was a monk wondered whether there was another monk who could benefit him 
or teach him a new kind of asceticism. So it might have just been a restlessness to become, you know, to be challenged further, but it might have been some of the spiritual pride saying, well, I'm already at this highest level. There's no one greater than me. But in order to teach him, our Lord did um, bring him out to this desert and revealed to him that no human being can reach perfection. And so he started down this path of saying, okay, but how can I grow further? How can I keep growing? And he came to this monastery and lived right here. And so he was living according to the rule. And at one point, um, he went out into the desert like the monks did at that time uh, to pray, especially during uh, the fast of Lent. And he wanted to go deep into the desert. And so he went that way. He went directly to the hermit caves that are across the Jordan. So he walked over 20 days, it says, over into the desert. And then he sat down to pray and to eat something. And then he saw in the shadows um, something moving and he thought, oh, maybe it's a demoniac, demoniac spirit or something. And then he realized it was a human person, uh, but without clothing and with very sunburnt skin and really, really white hair. And so he said, what is this? And so he cried out for this uh, person to stop, followed the person, but the person kept running away. And then finally he said, please stop, because he was so desperate to meet somebody that could help challenge him in his spiritual life. And so he wanted to receive the blessing from what he perceived to be a very holy desert father. And as soon as he reached a torrent, in other words, the river, he was very tired. And so it was interesting that he stopped. And this figure that he saw in the distance actually called his name and says Zosimus. And of course that impressed him immensely. And so he said, you know, do not turn around because uh, she explained that she was a woman and that she didn't have enough clothing. And that's when you know, there's a lot of images of him actually giving her his cloak. And so Mary of Egypt put it around her body. And so she asked for that and she wanted to come and receive his blessing. And so at this point, uh, Abba Sassimus did whatever she said and she turned around towards him. He, he knelt before her to receive her blessing. But she knelt down at the same time to receive his. And it says, and this is a quote from her story, and thus they lay on the ground prostrate, asking for each other's blessing. So this was the very first meeting of Abba Zosimus and Amma Mary of Egypt. Now it says that because um, the Abba asked for her blessing, she said to him, No, Holy Father, that I am only a sinful woman, though I am guarded by my holy baptism. I am no spirit, but earth and ashes and flesh alone. And so this is when they began their conversation of when Mary started to speak about what brought her into this desert, so close to Jerusalem, yet so far away from everyone else. And so she began to explain her life. So I want to read a little bit about her life to each one of you. She said, when I was 12 years old, she was in Egypt, she ran away from home and she went to the big city of Alexandria. And you can imagine a beautiful young 12 year old girl going into a city without anyone to protect her. And it's, she says this, I at first ruined my virginity and then unrestrainedly and insatiably gave myself up, gave myself up to sensuality. And then she explained to Abba Zosimus that um, she didn't do this to make money. In fact, many times she would live this way, not for the sake of gain, she says, here I speak the pure truth. She did her work for free, doing free of charge what gave me pleasure. And then she revealed, I had an insatiable desire and an irrepressible passion for lying and filth. This was life to me. Every kind of abuse of nature I regarded as life. So this is the first revelation she's making to this uh, desert father, Zosimus. It is her story of facing the truth of who she is, recognizing what true life is, and recognizing how she was bound. And this is what she continues to explain. She went, uh, because of her desolate life, she said, well, I'm going to follow some pilgrims to Jerusalem, because there were many pilgrims that would come up from Egypt to the Holy Sepulcher. And she said, oh, maybe I can find some in the crowd um, to not only satisfy myself, but also sort of to bring them down. And so she's living a life, not just which is hurting her, but hurting so many people. 
and she says there was no mentionable or unmentionable depravity of which I was not their teacher, speaking of pilgrims. And she said, I'm amazed, Abba, how the sea stood our licentiousness, how the earth did not open its jaws, and how it was that hell, how it was that hell did not swallow me alive when I had entangled in my net so many souls. So she said during this journey, she was not content with merely corrupting the young, but corrupting many others from the inhabitants of the city and foreigners. And this was in Jerusalem. And so she went during the feast of the Honorable Cross. And so you can imagine at this point, you know, even though she said before to St. Zosimus that she was protected by baptism, what was it that was moving her? And she went around the streets seducing young souls. And so at one point she said, well, I'll just follow them in and see the Holy Sepulcher and venerate the Holy Cross. That's why the pilgrims came. But when she got to the Holy Sepulcher, they did not let her enter. She tried again and she was not able to enter. She tried again. And it was just because people didn't want her to enter. She said there was something inside of her. There was some type of force that would not let her enter. And so because of the different people around, she, she wandered around and then she stopped in front of the image of Our Lady, in front of the image of the Theotokos. And that just means the God bearer, you know, the mother of, of Jesus who is God, so the mother of God. And she stood there in front of Mary and something broke in her. And she said that she felt grieved by what she was doing. And she also felt that um, he gave, she gave her strength in prayer. So after this encounter with this image of Mary, she actually went into the Holy Sepulchre and venerated the word of the Honorable Cross. And so when she stood in front of the icon of Mary, she had great repentance and she asked for guidance and help from the mother of Jesus. And so she venerated the Holy Cross, this time unhindered, and it was at this point in prayer that she heard a call. And this voice was urging her to journey into the desert beyond the Jordan, which is right over there beyond the Jordan. And so she took the road to the desert, um, having previously crossed the Holy Monastery of the Baptist. There was a monastery of John the Baptist on the Jordan River on this side. And then she went into the desert for 47 years. And she explained to Abba Zosimus, she didn't meet anyone. In fact, many times in icons of her or images of her, you'll see her only with three loaves of bread. That's all she took with her and then just lived from what she could find. So she actually explained to the Abba that for the first 17 years, she struggled very hard to defeat her thoughts and desires. And eventually after this, she was able to fight off the memories of her previous life. I mean, what trauma, what trauma she must have lived. And then she confessed this, and this is quoting, 17 years I passed in this desert fighting wild beasts, mad desires and passions. And she said she had many desires for food and drink and profligate songs and many thoughts that sought to incline her towards fornication. And then she said when a thought came to her, she would fall to the ground, wetted with her tears and not get up until a calm and sweet light, she says, descended and enlightened her and chased away the thoughts that possessed me. So she prayed constantly and remembered this image of the mother of God that changed her life. And this is what brought her to repentance. So once her garment was destroyed, she put on what she could find. And this is why uh, the saint found her in such, that, in such a state. And so this was her situation. It was absolutely incredible. So the great condition in which um, Mary was found had Zosimus recognize her as a saint. But he also recognized her because she knew his name. How did she know that? Well, she was accustomed to listening to the voice of God. In this desert, she learned to pray. And so, in a sense, it was as if she was nourished by the voice of God and by the grace of God. She said, I am fed and clothed by the all-powerful word of God, the Lord of all. That's what she learned in this desert. Now, when Abba Zosimus explained the life of Mary of Egypt to the bishop, he actually said that he saw Mary in prayer a number of times and explained that she had a sort of unceasing prayer, a constant conversation with the Lord. 
And when he saw her lift her eyes to heaven, he actually said it seemed as if she was coming up, kind of elevating from the earth as she stretched out her hands to pray in a whisper. And so this was uh, fascinating. Now, after this first meeting, um, Amma, well, Amma, I mean, I'm calling her Amma, not because she had followers, but because she became a source of admiration and a guide really for a lot of desert fathers. So after her first meeting, she asked um, Zosimus to come back on a Holy Thursday so that he could give her communion. And so in this place, he made the journey from here to find her again and gave her Holy Communion. And so what was beautiful is this transformed her existence after many years of great repentance. And this is what she said. I thirst for them, the bread and the wine turned into God, Christ's body and blood. I thirst for them with irrepressible love and longing. And so she came across the Jordan River in a miraculous way. Um, Zosimus gave her the Eucharist and she raised her hands to heaven and sighed with tears, it says in her biography. She said, now let your servant depart in peace, O Lord, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. The same words, of course, uh, that we pray every day in Compline and, um, you know, quoting, of course, Simon when he took Jesus in his arms. So then she begged him to come again to the river where he would, where he met her for the first time and where he met her this time to bring her um, communion once more. And so she went across the river where she came and Zosimus came back here. And so it's interesting what Zosimus explains. He says, you know, he had found what he had asked the Lord for. This was someone who challenged him to go deeper, further, higher, and, you know, more in intimacy, to grow more in intimacy with the Lord. And that is what he desired with his whole heart and soul. And so he was really excited to come and see her again. And he says in his own story, having walked many days, he finally arrived at the place and was looking, he says, like a skilled hunter, seeks the sweetest prey, the saint of God. He wanted to, you know, be filled with the sanctity that she, she showed him. And this is what he says. Show me, O Lord, your pure treasure, which you have concealed in the desert. Show me, I pray, the angel of the flesh, of which the world is not worthy. And so it says, Abba Sassimus and the saint were together, in a way, very great friends. They became a treasure one to the other. And it says, um, when he finally found her in the same place that he had met her before, she had died. And it says that she had her face turned to the east, which means the sun rising, you know, the, 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 um, the way the churches are faced to the risen Lord coming up and giving her life, her arms crossed, and she was waiting for the Lord. And so that's when he actually said, oh my gosh, she died. And she, he found then an inscription there that explained that she actually died um, the same day she may have wrote, written after he gave her communion. And she died on that spot, having come into the embrace of the Lord whom she learned to love after so many years in the desert. And so again, here's this you know, story of a lion. It was filled with different lions. There was a lion around that dug, that helped him to dig a hole where she, he was able to bury her. And that's when he went into Jerusalem and told the story of Mary of Egypt. And a commentary by one of the um, Orthodox priests in this area about her life, I think is just beautifully said. It says, the life of St. Mary of Egypt shows how a prostitute, how a sinner can be made uh, in or deified by grace, how a human being can become an angel in the flesh, and how hope, according to Christ, can be replaced by the despair that comes from the devil. In the person of Mary of Egypt, we see someone who seeks pleasure and chases people for her satisfaction, but by the grace of God becomes so sanctified that she reaches the point where saints chase after her to receive her blessing and embrace her honorable body to the point where even wild animals, referring to that um, lion, reverence her. And so with her deep repentance, her humility, her transcendence through grace and uh, her humility, her pride is broken and her ascetic achievements become an inspiration for the monks here in the desert. In her biography, it actually, she repeats the prayer that she said when she was going into the Holy Sepulchre. She said, O lady, order the entrance of the church to be open to me. 
Be my faithful witness before your son that I will never again defile my body with the impurity of fornication. But as soon as I have seen the wood of the cross, I will renounce the world and its temptations and will go wherever you lead me. And she let her hear. She let her hear. So as soon as Mary of Egypt venerated the cross, the spiritual inspiration and the power of the experience of the mystery of the cross came into her life. And then she was able to fight and overcome the struggles inside. It was because of the grace that came through the blood, just like when we came into the tabernacle when uh, we were in the desert. So she gives us an example of so much, so much. And I just want to end by um, speaking about the great spiritual friendship that can happen between avas and amas in the desert, that can happen between men and women saints, that can happen between saints of every age. Because you have this friendship, this holy friendship, where you have these two people asking uh, each other to be blessed, to be lifted up, and to be brought to the Lord. That is holy friendship. So as we finish our reflection here on St. Mary of Egypt and on St. Zosimus, these desert, this desert father and mother that are leading us into Holy Week, um, let's pray for our spiritual friends. Let's identify who our spiritual friends might be. I love the icon where you have God the Father, you know, blessing uh, Mary and Zosimus together. Um, let's ask him to bless us. And from here in this monastery, I pray for each and every one of you. Let's take Mary's hand as we enter Holy Week. Let's let her bring us to the foot of the cross. Let's learn from Amma Mary of Egypt to raise our hearts to God and desire only Him. And may God bless you, and we'll see you tomorrow.